How are you doing Monday night? It is uh, the physicist and philosopher hour. I am the philosopher and Dr. Claudia Albers is our, our physicist. How are you, Claudia? I'm very well. Thank you, Wayne. And how are you? Doing good, doing good. We got some snow in here and, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. So how about yourself? Although I will say this about this storm that came through. It was unusual uh, for us here in Colorado because the storm, two things, was unusually warm. Mm -hmm. And two, this particular storm was what we would call... Um, moisture saturated uh we got i think the meteorologists were saying typically you would look at you know 10 inch 10 inches of snow equate to one inch of water mm -hmm. this one we were at it i think they were saying seven inches was equivalent to one inch so it was a very wet mm. wet storm very unusual we should have gotten this storm these are the type of storms we get in april here Yes, I think I also wrote an article oh, about something yeah. that yeah. happened. Yeah. And that yeah. was that we had spring one day and winter the next. Mm -hmm. Which Topsy is turvy. It no, it's not normal. It, it just it shows me exactly how they bring in the weather actually. And well, that is they actually turn on the simulator, ionize the atmosphere in order to attract one of the planet X objects to the region, which then brings the rain. That's well, how they're controlling the weather. We definitely. That's why there's always high heat before a big storm. Well, we're living it. And we saw <laughs> here. So, um, you know, we got a lot of viewer submitted uh, pictures and some videos uh, and let yes. me pull some of these up because um, it's really very impressive. Um, so let's see. Yeah, we'll start with this one. Mm -hmm. And give me one second. I'm driving as I'm flying and it's like I'm texting while driving. So colorful uh, um, clouds these days, Claudia. Indeed. And why? Because we have luminescent clouds. In other words, planet X system clouds that are emitting light as they absorb energy from the Earth's atmosphere. And then that is uh, far out. <laughs> yeah. And then the electrons, they settle into their energy levels in, inside the water molecules. They release uh, the excess energy as photons. That's why they emit light. And then they use uh, holographic projections to try and mask this. They're actually trying to make us think that it's normal to have pink clouds. Yeah. Well, I also love the turquoise in here. And oh, then, yeah, it's beautiful, isn't yeah, it? I mean, it's just not normal. Far out. <laughs> um, this one came from Colorado, and I want to let, do you see this? Mm-hmm. Well, this is not an anomaly of the camera lens. This is actually was in the sky. And as you can see. Yeah, I see it's got a somewhat of, it's, it's a hexagonal. A hexagonal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it looks hexagonal. So that's definitely a device in the atmosphere. It's either the simulator or one of the lensing systems. But yeah. you can see it's artificial because of the straight lines in it. It's Look not a that. natural object. Yes. And the color diffusion again where mm, we see yeah. this all over claudia yeah this just amazes me um, yeah some of, some of the colors we are seeing in the sky are not natural they are produced by holographic projectors that is one of the lens interfaces which they produce out of the atmosphere itself and i first saw this in the jfp movie uh video where it was fluctuating. In other words, I think they're using sound wave generators to uh, produce this interface. They produce a high density of air itself by aiming a couple of uh, sound waves at it. And 
there's a point where it intersects, it causes a very high density, and that leads to a lens interface. Well, uh, I think yeah. that you that sent this one in, and this and mm, very papers, interesting, very, uh, and mm. you can really see just that's probably one of the most unusual ones yeah. I, I have seen. Um, mm. Here, let's see. These are uh, again some mm -hmm. very interesting. I know they say, "Well, these are sun dogs." I get what you know, but I'm yeah, a... that you know, I've written about that as well. It, it, it's not natural to get these rainbow effects in the sky. That straight line, it looks almost like a straight line there. It's either that or it's a very large sun halo that we don't see the full thing. It's definitely produced by artificial lenses. It, there is no other way to produce that rainbow effect in the sky. It's either a lens or it's a holographic projector actually projecting that kind of thing in the sky. It's never natural. I would agree. And mm. here, um, Same thing and again, here, look at this. Now, mm. this is what I found so interesting. So we can go with the argument that this is all right at 20 degrees, 23 degrees. But wait a minute. Yeah, but <laughs> you see it already. We've got a huge halo here with a setting sun. And look what's happening up here. Mm. Yes, but even this the story of this 23 degrees, I've, I've explained very carefully in, in one of articles that it's impossible. Ice crystals cannot at all produce a rainbow effect. Ice crystals, ice has a lower refractive index than liquid water. It cannot produce enough separation of the light to produce a rainbow effect with just two refractions. And the normal rainbow, it takes three. It takes one at exiting of the droplet, one uh, as the light enters the droplet, and one at the back of the droplet, which is a total internal reflection. It takes three. And ice with a lesser refractive index cannot do that. Ice can light can only exit an ice crystal at different angles for each crystal because they will never be absolutely aligned. It's absolutely illogical to say that these, um, these sun halos are natural and caused by ice. It's impossible. Well, as we can see here as well is that you have one halo here, there's another one here, and mm -hmm. I've never seen where I actually saw three halos when you look at this. Yeah. Uh, this, it gets better. This one here, um, again, it's becoming more obvious that it's become almost like a straight line in there. It is. Uh, that one is a straight line. And that one is here. a little bit rounded, but it's got a bend in it. It does. And, and you know, <laughs> look at one, two three wow uh, that is weird now mm. uh, this is a video sent to us from romania and uh it was sent to me this morning mm -hmm. we the individual who sent this uh is roman and take a look oh yes mm -hmm. yeah it gets this better. Is... Wait a minute, it gets better Wait till you see. There you go. Oh, my now, goodness. I was going to say that was three overlapping sun halo uh, simulators, but it turns out it's four. It actually is the other one around the behind the other two. It's six. Oh, uh, wait till you oh see is it what's six? Above. Wait till you see what's above. Oh, my goodness. Well, there I've counted four so far. There it is. Oh, there's another there? one. Well, that yeah. one. Does it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. It's inverted. He said. It yeah. Was well, it, it's it's the edge of a lens for another one up there. My goodness. One, two, three, four, five so far. <laughs> six. Six over here. And this, he said, went around. Um, oh, yes. That one there. Yes, I can see that other one. So, Another inverted one. Look at that. Wow. They are really, you know, 
trying uh, very hard. I've never seen so many in one patch of sky before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. And I just want to thank Roman for sending this yeah. in. Um, we have um, viewers and subscribers in uh, Europe, and uh, we appreciate all of our subscribers in Romania. Mm. Um, here is another one. I will believe this is in England. Watch what happens here. I'll read the email that the gentleman sent with this, but here, watch this. What you can actually see what something's going on right here. He said it was. Mm, yeah, something seems to be appearing there. Yes, that's what he said. It was very obvious. And yeah. there it is. Mm. So we have, uh, and then the big uh, wolf uh, blood moon coming up. Um, so just think we let our viewers see this, um, which brings up a question, Dr. Albers. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now we know that the moon will be coming into perigee at uh, 222,274 miles, which is its closest approach, they keep telling us. Um, there, uh, I had a person who sent me the experiment that Richie from Boston did using, I think it was a Nikon 900 where he was on, I guess, the roof of a, um, downtown building or was filming or was zooming his camera. Anyway, he was trying to zoom in, I think to the furthest building away I think someone said it was four or five miles away. He could not. He could not zoom in and get the details of that building. Uh -huh. But he could look at the same camera and look up at the moon with the same camera and find the minute details <laughs> of craters and craters. His contention is, is if his camera could not focus in on something that was less than five miles away, how could his camera zoom in on an object that was 238,000 miles away? Because the moon is a holographic projection in our skies. We're not seeing the real moon. I mean, I have written article after article showing this. I've even sh I have an article where I show exactly an airplane interrupting the projection of the holographic projector that's producing the moon in the sky. So what happens here is we have a scheduled uh, blood moon. So what okay. do they do? They, we, we're not seeing the real moon. So they give us a holographic projection of the, the blood moon. That's all. Well... <laughs> That, I mean, it's one of those conundrums. Um, more and more, uh, you know, when I look at night, at the nighttime sky here, I get up at four o'clock in the morning many times and, you know, about 6,000 feet up, I can see a lot of the firmament, <laughs> much closer than someone down at sea level. But. Yeah, the moon is much closer to you because as far as I know, that moon is at about 10 to 15,000 feet. Well, I know this, the last I fly right through it. <laughs> and you, the last full moon I was out, um, you didn't need a flashlight. You didn't need any light at all. Yeah. Because so they, they, they making it way, way brighter than the natural moon ever was. Indeed. I have a special treat for you, Claudia. Uh, um, this good. was a, um, let me get here and so I can pull it up for us. This is a interactive program of the ecliptic uh, of the uh, Milky Way. This is the ecliptic plane right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, Claudia, this is such a cool tool. Watch this. I can zoom in and wait till you see the clarity that you can zoom in. Mm. Is this not the coolest thing? Now, mm -hmm. I want to show you something. Look, at, we can go in as far as we want. Is the wow. You ready? It still gets better. Mm. I'm going to let it catch up. 
is this not the coolest thing? And I'm not even halfway there yet. Mm. And as you do this in real time on your home computer, yeah. uh, it gets even better. Look at this. We're actually seeing, um, but what I really wanted to show you, and I'll let you have to let the rendering engine catch up. Otherwise, it, uh, mm -hmm. it's like a slow train. Yeah. <laughs> so let me pull back out here and let me show you this. He says, well, what happened? Okay. Mm. Let, me, let me. Okay. That's not what I wanted to show you. There's uh, a lot of data in this. A I lot can... of data, but uh, let me yeah. get it here. There we go. So this begins to show us, there we go. Is this not the most, there you go, Claudia. Mm. That's the ecliptic plane. And as we get into different filters, you can really see the great voids. Mm -hmm. Look at this. That's the one I wanted to show you. So what it turns out, there are these globulars all along the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, isn't that fascinating? Yeah, it, and that agrees with everything I've said before about that image that you first sent me for yeah. um, the center of the galaxy, from yes, the center yeah. of the center of galaxy. And what I discovered is that the center of the galaxy, the galactic nucleus, had split into pieces, and all the pieces were... Um, ejecting material that was then condensing into globular clusters. Yes. And so now we're seeing the globular clusters that have been ejected by the galactic nucleus. Here it is. This That's is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. These are new star systems that. Mm, yeah. Uh, look at and it will condense into, it starts out as a fluid. And then it condenses into particles. It separates into particles that actually turn out to be stars. It's really amazing. It's, it isn't. I mean, when I look at this, you see, yeah. you know, I, I, I am in awe mm -hmm. of this universe that we live in. Anyway, I'll send you this link. Yeah. Uh, it is just a tremendous tool to use. Mm -hmm. that you can get into many different filters. Um, you can use, uh, I was playing with this today, getting a little bit better to it. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Yeah, it's fascinating, yes. Now let me get this one. Let I mean, that, that idea of seeing the globular clusters, that, you know, that always interests me. So let's take because, a um, look on this one here. We were just looking at this, as you were saying, as it's been ejected out mm. um, in the black and white, Claudia, it gets amazing. Yeah, it, it, what fascinates me is the fact that the universe works the same at all levels. Yeah. It's the most beautiful thing that all planets, stars, galactic nuclei all do the same thing. They create themselves from the inside out. It's amazing, and isn't it? It's amazing. And it's like... I don't know how physics, Dr. Albert, and particularly when we look at astrophysics, and how they begin to think that they can actually measure the universe. I, I, I think it's a fallacy that if they think that the universe is 14 billion light years old. I, I'm not buying it. Uh, I, I don't no, think- No, I mean, we cannot know how old the universe is. The thing is, the reason why they think that is because they are using redshift to measure distances, but that has, fa has been falsified over and over again for years now. That red shift is intrinsic. It's not associated with recessional velocity. At least most of it is not. It's impossible because you have quasars of high red shift in the same place as galaxies of low red shift. It's completely illogical to think that redshift has to do with recessional velocity and therefore the distance to things. It's impossible. But they persist in believing this and working as if it's all they have. It, but it makes no sense. But that's the way physics are. I've just 
started. You were, in fact, would you tell someone, everybody, though, I want to thank all of the moderators, all of you good people here that are watching uh, um, March on America. Right. Yes. Yes. March for America. March Media. for America. Thank and you. And they will be watching. So hello. Thank you. So you were talking that you have now a title for your new book, and I thought it was very revealing. Um, and I'll let you pick it up that basically you're putting forth that physics has failed, modern physics. Yes, um, basically physics has failed to understand how the universe works for one simple reason. Physicists, ex most of the time, refuse to think logically. They simply <laughs> refuse <laughs> to do it. And, and, and it's the simplest of things because in our daily lives, we never expect an effect without a cause. If your car. Oh, can, stop in, right there. No. can you repeat that again? No. In our daily lives. Pardon? No effect without a cause, right? Yeah, we never expect any effect without a cause. So if in the morning our car suddenly looks damaged, we don't think it just happened. <laughs> that no. it did it by itself because it's a cycle. Do we? No, no we don't. I, no. But we think that everything that happens with the sun, it's because it's the sun by itself doing it. It's a cycle. Oh, I see where you're going. Okay, I see where see, you're going. That's yeah. the pro it's the same thing with quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, things happen because they just happen. That's an effect without a cause. Quantum mechanics makes absolutely no sense. Einstein was absolutely correct. He said, God does not play dice with the universe. He was right. There is no effect without a cause. It's illogical. So because physicists believe that you can have effects without causes, they have failed to look for the cause behind effects. And therefore, they never get to the truth. I love that's this. The, that's the main problem. And the other failing is that they fail with observation. They ignore them because it doesn't agree with the theory. And yeah, with, isn't that so true? It, and that's the two main failings of physics. That's why it has failed to understand how the universe works, because we have clear images of objects in the sun's corona, but they ignore them all because according to theory, it's impossible. So they have failed to use those observations, which I have not, to understand how the sun really works, how the universe really works. And the other thing that is illogical is they do not seem to realize that a nucleus is positive, an electron is negative. And that if you do not have a force that counteracts the electric force, atoms cannot exist. So they have failed to understand that. So they have ignored one of the forces in the universe. And therefore, they can never understand how the universe works. Well, that's why you have theoretical physicists to, as I heard one explain it, yeah, I can answer any question you have if you give me enough time and I have to have enough variables? <laughs> well, I guess. I mean, come on. I mean, how hard is that? <laughs> yeah, the other thing they fail, which I didn't even get into, is to <laughs> simplify. They always try to complicate things as much as possible. Why? That, that, that's like trying to walk on your head. <laughs> I've seen because some people you years. cannot understand anything. All you will get is confusion. <laughs> oh, I love this. So, Dr. Alberts, do you believe that uh, the United States, along with probably the other superpowers, are much more advanced in space exploration, space vehicles than what they tell the, the public? Oh, of course they are. I have of a treat. Of course. And I think this whole thing started uh, in the 20th century, or actually around just before the Second World War, where the aliens started leaking the technology 
to the people that they were going to be the elites or the black programs. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Do yeah. You, do you, do you, can you see that? Yes. All right. Let's have some fun. Um, this came out and, and you have to give me a second here because my, all right. So let's blow this up and let's have some fun. Okay. This is Rockwell International. This is a real document. It's on their website, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, this is 1983. We start out um, first generation of reusable spacecraft, the American mm -hmm. Space Shuttle Program, Challenger, Columbia, Discovery, Atlantis. Uh, please give me one second. Here it is. Uh, I have to get that. Let's see. Give me one second here. Anyway, so let's take a peek over here. All right, this is the integrated space plan. This is the preliminary version, right? Mm -hmm. um, 1989. Yes, and it's very important that we read the legend here. So this has been produced by Mr. Ronald M. Jones, uh, gives his designation number. He says about this diagram, the Rockwell Integrated Space Plan, the ISP, is a very long range systematic perspective of America's and the Western World Space Program. Its 100 plus year vision was created from the integration of numerous NASA long range studies, including Project Pathfinder case studies, recommendations from the National Commission on Space, report to the president, the RIDE report to NASA administration, and the new National Space Policy Directive. I'd like to stop right here, Claudia. Back in the day, I was a very um, staunch Republican. Let's put it that, very conservative. I was also um, very active in presidential politics. Ronald Reagan received a report in 1986 where it was the directive after he received this report that the United States started its secret space program. And since 1986 going forward, it's estimated we've spent over $21 trillion. We can't account for it in our treasury. So this mm -hmm. one I found very interesting. In here, it basically tells you how all of these organizations put in to this plan. Uh, it gives you, you, for instance, the ISP can be read from the top to the bottom, left to right. From top to bottom, vertical columns elements are phased in chronologically to support center line milestones. Reading across the column from left to right will yield the total scope of required activity within a given time period in support of the total integrated plan. So Claudia, this is basically a blueprint of what we have done as far as space exploration. And what I found so odd, Claudia, was that when I went in here and looked at this, it's spot on. So this was the plan that, and it's been carried out. Now, yes. there is one question that I would like to ask. I mean, I don't mean to you, but a, a general question to these people. How come the Germans had the ability to produce a uh, spacecraft that used anti-gravity drives. I and I brilliant. know they went to Germany after the Second World War to get the technology. And th the question is, why didn't they use it? I think they have used it, Claudia. Yes, but I not really in do. NASA. That's the thing. They kept it hidden. They Well, I think right here is your answer. The International Expendable Launch Vehicle Fleet. Um, back here in 1983, they started using private launch vehicles, uh, not even associated with the government. Planetary scientific missions. Uh, here was Space Lab, and then we get the GPS constellation. I've looked at this and it's uncanny to see where we have gone in this projected plan. 
Yeah, but they kept on using solid fuel rockets. And it's crazy to use solid fuel rockets. I mean, they could have used electromagnetics, anything, but solid fuel, it, it's the brute force of getting into space. It makes absolutely no sense when everything is electrical. Well, um, I, I can't debate on those merits. Uh, all I can say is when I look at this plan and uh, let everyone know, I'll put it in there. This plan, Claudia, appears to be uncannily mm -hmm. um, accurate, yes. particularly when we start getting in here into 2018. And this is the one I wanted to show where we are. Um, now, I guess it would be concerned if you look at, do you think the Chinese actually landed on the backside of the moon? No, I, you know, I, I wrote an article about this. First of all, there would be no sunlight. So the, no, I, I, I really think it's impossible. I, you know, the, the, just outside the Earth's atmosphere, it's full of objects at the moment. So is the sun's corona. I actually doubt that they're doing much traveling in space at all. Maybe going up to the upper atmosphere, but that's about it. Well, I have seen some strange things and, up and here, Mike. You know, the, and the, the thing is, um, you, you know, I, I wrote an article about that, that I didn't think, they didn't show any evidence that they had. You know, they, they show the same uh, a simulation of it landing. They show the sun shining on the other side of the moon in the simulation. But we know the sun cannot be shining. That's why we have a holographic projection of the moon in our atmosphere. We cannot see the real moon because the sun's not shining. It is not enough light for any photographs to be taken. And um, no, I, I think they're just fooling the public into thinking that they are doing this. Plus, they must make news. There must be news to keep the public entertained. Well, everyone has their own opinion and uh, their approach. I, I just found this one to be rather it's, fascinating. Uh huh. Earth's uh -huh. biosphere is, what was that? Yeah, it gets very interesting, Claudia, when you read this. From I, a terrestrial I was... to a solar species. Mm hmm. It's. Um... And you look, large, but, uh, I see they, they're planning to um, colonize space. Yes. Mm -hmm. Venus orbiting. Yeah. Now, this is 2038. Uh, we go all the way to nuclear 2000. Propulsion, nuclear pulse propulsion, Orion concept. Mm. Venus terraforming operations. Oh, my goodness. V <laughs> that. Something else. Lots of money behind this. And I'm just putting you over here where we're going to be. I will probably be already on my next journey. Um, you can see that. And of course, I'm sure that they have added to this. Human expansion into the cosmos. And I'll just end it with here. Uh, 2100 human interspace traveler. Uh, we're starting to reach out. Um, apparently, we will be Earth Skyhook, large scale human habitation on Mars, interstellar traveling world ships. Well, I actually heard that they had a base on Mars in the 1970s. Well, according to Laura Eisenhower, I've had her on my channel, and anyone can check out her channel. She will tell you her grand father uh we are there exactly so what's this doing there in the plan so late in the plan well you know when we look at here this is you know the turn of the century um by then mm -hmm. i guess we'll have all the components you know i think that this is quite remarkable in fact i don't know this is just my opinion but it looks like bezos um uh, branson musk uh it looks like this is what they're using. 
Um, you know, you talked about right here, nuclear powered electric propulsion. Mm. Isn't that, uh, I've never heard using in uh, some of these different venues. But anyway, I wanted to yeah, show- Yeah, we, we haven't heard about them using it. No, no. And look, this is in the 2003 timeline. Yes. Uh, solar powered electrical propulsion. Um, yes, that's comet, a solar sail. And look at here. I found this one really odd. Comet sample return mission. We did this. We first did that in 1985, I believe. Um, well, it is in the history. It was one of the spacecraft that was in the L1 position that was um, recommissioned to do a comet um, flyby. And I think that that's when they started uh, doing these missions to comets was in the early 1980s. But well, here yeah, the, but there's, I have reason to believe that they actually knew what was going on from the 1960s. I think they did. I think it's very and, well done. Um, they had the technology to do a lot of things that they haven't told us yet that they can do. I found this one interesting. Near-Earth Solar Cell Asteroid Explorer. Mm. I mean, yeah, they, have, that they definitely think? have not done that. I, I've, I've heard them talking about the solar sail technology, but I haven't heard of them using it to go to asteroids. Uh, well, you know, the Japanese, they've made their, and well, you know, if you go by, um, you know, what was it? We had Thule this year, but as again, as I went across here, this is the most interesting thing because these technologies, you know, I was in the technology business, was at many investor forums of uh, advanced new technologies. And I look at this and I just shake my head and I'm going, they're doing this stuff. Anyway, I just thought you might find that. A very complex plan, that's for sure. Well, it is. It was well thought out and I'll pull it out here. Um, so everyone can see just the complexity uh, of this. It is quite the piece of work. <laughs> that that uh, that yeah. is yeah. That that someone spent some time on that. Anyway, just thought that you might probably find that, it was a working group. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rockwell, Lockheed Martin, uh, just some of the companies that are involved in that. So, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I, th I think that a group of uh, technical people, uh, space scientists and um, engineers sat down and they had a brainstorming um, meeting and they took a couple of weeks or months maybe to put it all together in that form. They did a, a um, well... Yeah, I'll tell you, I, I, I just find this one to be most interesting of all. So anyway, I um, thought I would also pull up for you. Um, give me one second. I'm looking down here as I'm going, because I actually have. Yes, folks, I actually did this ahead of time. And now I can't find my plan. Oh, no. <laughs> I got it all here. All right. So. Um, I have a couple of your papers pulled up. Mm. So that's nice. What did you choose? Um, well, let's see. I found a couple of them that I thought were really interesting. Yeah, I, I've been writing so many. I, you know, I even forget sometimes what I've written. I have to go back. Oh, this one. Yeah. <laughs> Planet X and the alien floating cities in the sky. I like yeah, this I find the floating cities quite fascinating. And, um, you know, people have, I wrote a couple and um, people were saying, no, it's impossible because planes will collide with them. Now we cannot have cities in the sky. But again, the observations tell us that there are cities in the sky. Look at this. So we have buildings in the sky. We're looking out over the ocean. This looks out over the ocean. Buildings rise out of cloud. 
over the ocean. There has to be something they're building on. I mean, they built these buildings upon, but it's only oceans. And so, and they're not always there. So that has to be a floating city. And then there's the problem that people say it's mirage. It's a mirage. But if you can see them from two different angles and you can clearly see this is the same city that that one's from 2017 and it's being seen from the different angles. A mirage is a two dimensional image in the distance. It's not a three dimensional thing that you can see from different angles. So that shows you it's not a mirage. And then the thing was that just before this, I had found an article. I mean, I had found a photograph of um, iridescent clouds and there were rocks amongst them. So there were rocks in the sky. Okay, there weren't cities on those, but it showed that you do have floating rocks as I have suggested they are because they come in from the planet X system, they low in gravitational energy. And so they behave like very low density objects, even though they are very high density rocks. So they, they become suspended in the atmosphere. That's also why clouds are suspended in the atmosphere. It's illogical to expect liquid water to remain suspended in the atmosphere. And there's something is different about that water than the water we have on the surface of our planet. And it's low in gravitational energy. That's what it is. So as you can see, clearly you have cities in the sky. And these, again, I don't know why they seem to appear so often over China. They, they are. They are over China most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see, that's very, very interesting right there. You can clearly see those old buildings. Look at those straight lines. It, it's, it's a city skyline in the yeah, sky. It's very odd, kids. And you see the mountains right below here. Yeah, but there they weren't no mountains. That's all cloud. No, no, I'm right here. These are clouds here? Yeah, it's all clouds. Okay. There, there were no mountains at all. Nothing. They're just floating. They're floating in the sky. Absolutely floating. No, no, I, I'm not disputing that they're floating. But what I'm saying in the backdrop here, that looks like there's mountains on the horizon here. Mm -mm. But No, I'm not sure about that. I don't... Not sure, but I I didn't. But that's think floating. So. There is that. They just floating, yeah. Yeah. Look at those. You know, it's not very clear here that because there was quite a lot of cloud, um, but you can still see the outline of the buildings, and it's the same city. Yeah. Let me get back out. So, I thought this was interesting. You so you found mm -hmm. in Chinese lore. Mm -hmm. um stories of floating cities right yeah and you know what happened someone left a comment under one of my videos i read all my comments saying something about ancient chinese images show floating rocks i went looking for it <laughs> did you find it yeah there we are you can see yeah. on the right hand side it looks like two mountains at least the front one seems to be floating it's not connected to the ground Interesting. And this rock here in, in the center of this image does not look like it belongs there. It's a huge rock. Looks totally different from the rest of the terrain. And you can see broken trees around it, behind it, and on, on the left-hand side. And on the right, you can see like a piece of it is actually over one house and the trees are leaning over. It's like this piece of rock came down and settled on the ground on this, on the surface here. This is exactly what you expect to happen with these huge rocks that are planet X system debris pieces. They don't fall. They would be become suspended and over time, would come down and settle down gently on the ground. That looks like this is what's happened here. And I can see the correlation with Jack and the Beanstalk. Yes. I mean, you know. And it's an old, old fairy tale. So obviously, <laughs> yeah. where did people get the idea that there's a city and giants up there in the clouds? I, I listen, I they did 
they made a movie on that and I thought they did a yeah. great job on it. I yeah, mean, I, I, I watched the movie on that as yeah. well. It's where the Nephilim went. That's right. The yeah. Nephilim, the giants. So they say. Mm. <laughs> so, so is that it, what you came up with? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm putting together all the information that I have. And then I explain about the Planet X system that they are low gravitational energy objects. That's why the gravitational influence is so low when they go to the sun and why they haven't disturbed the solar. I've been writing about this for months and months about that. And the fact that they have a debris field, which is the broken pieces of what was once the outer layers of a planet. And these pieces, as these objects come into the Earth's atmosphere, so does the debris. But the debris is low in energy, so it's low in gravitational influence, which translates them into just having the same gravitational energy as, for example, oxygen molecules, even though they are much denser. That's why they float in the atmosphere. So we get rocks floating in the atmosphere. I've been writing about this for ages, but it's only recently that I came up with real evidence that this, you know, because there was that, I'm not sure if I put it, I probably put it in this article. Actually rocks, there they are. Look at that. That looks like the tip of mountains uh, with cloud around it hmm. in the sky except there's no mountain underneath supporting them. It's clearly rock. Rock formations underneath the cloud. The cloud draped across it sometimes. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. You can clearly see on the right hand side that the pieces, hard um, pieces of some dense material producing those shapes right underneath the cloud. Over here? Uh, no further up. No. Over, yeah. Down there. Here? Um, a bit more to the right. Yeah, you have those pieces and then you have the other ones a little further to the right. Okay. Okay. You can see the shapes of them pushing through the cloud. And it's, it's clearly, it, it's solid pieces of something within the clouds. Clouds are not solid. They are little droplets of water. So they're not gaseous, but you know, they, they, be, they move around. They, they will follow the contours of a dense solid object, which would be a rock. And you can see this is exactly what we have here. It's rocks in suspended in the atmosphere. So another next logical question someone would say, then how would pilots or planes avoid these? Well, this, this thing is, these if they are rocks amongst clouds, they will register as intense storms on radar. So that means that planes would avoid them. That's the first thing. But mm -hmm. it's likely that they are collisions now and then with the cities or with these rocks. And then that's probably when the planes disappear. And, you know, no one ever finds out what happens to them without a trace. Yeah. And there have been cases of that. I mean, mm -hmm. how many times have planes flown into the Bermuda Triangle and never appeared again? Is it possible there are cities in the skies over the in the Bermuda Triangle? Maybe. Could be. Could be. Now, what I think they are actually all over the world. I. And uh, the reason why is, as, as I have shown in previous articles, these sun halos can only be produced artificially by a sun simulator. That's the only way. It's impossible to have a natural sun halo. And I showed that at length in one of the previous articles. But here we have a picture, a, um, a painting from 1535, showing these things in the sky. And several of them. I think there are five of them. So what are they? They are sun halo simulators, but they're not produced by man. Because man did not have the technology then. These are 
alien sun simulators. And it shows that the aliens were hiding what was going on with the sun then in 1535. Hmm. I think it's also the uh, painting with uh, Nuremberg. Yeah, I, I think there was some kind of fight in the sky. Um, this one, yep. yeah. Yep. So, so th this is what they were here then. They were high. And I think actually, I've written um, also in other articles that I think the sun started going dark periodically for small uh, periods of time long before it went permanently dark by 1998. And we had sun halo observations from the Hong Kong Observatory from 1976. And it showed that it went, at least it went dark seven times in 1884, because that's when the sun halos were seen. This is from the movie Avatar. As you know, they put the truth often comes in the movies. And in the movie Avatar, we had floating rocks within the atmosphere of this planet, which basically, where does the idea come from? Well, we have floating rocks within the Earth's atmosphere because they come from the planet X system. These, are, this, these would be pieces of the broken planets that are invading our solar system. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. I remember the movie. And I have, yes. I think many of the movies are nothing more than I think. What I remember the most about that movie was the landscape. It was so beautiful, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I found this article is interesting too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I have seen this uh, in other places as well. Mm -hmm. What's going on here? Yeah, so what we have, we have the moon superimposed on a three-dimensional object in the atmosphere. And so that's a holographic projection. That's how the moon is produced there. That's also why it's so bright. Naturally, the real moon would never be this bright. If you remember what the moon used to look like, it was never this bright. This is almost as bright as the sun simulator uh, sun. Mm -hmm. And you can see that's a, another object there, and the two do not coincide. If you try to draw the outline of the full circle of the moon and the full circle of the object, you'll see that the two circles do not coincide. So there are two different circular objects there, or, or at least there's the circular object, which they meant to be the moon, which is a projection of the moon. And then there's another object coinciding with it. And I think they meant to use this projection of the moon to actually hide the object. The object is not dark. You can see it's, it's sort of a grayish and it's light on the side where the, most of the moon projection is. So I think it's actually an object covered in cloud like you'd expect the Planet X objects to be. Uh, so I actually think it's one of the stellar cores, one of the very small ones within our atmosphere. And I actually estimate its size uh, lower down. And that, that white blob on that side, that's um, because the, there's something on the surface of this object that is um, blocking the projection. So it looks some of the projection ended up on the wrong side. I think that's what it is. Could that be a, a meteorite hit, uh, a uh, explosion? I mean, this mm. is really out of sync with... I don't think so. I think it's, it's about the same brightness as the moon itself, so it's part of the holographic projection. It just ended up at the wrong place because it got interrupted by the object itself. So the projection is, in this case, most like it's usually from the left hand side, but in front. And possibly a, a part of it uh, never got to where it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be on the right hand side where most of the holographic projection on the moon is. But because the projector is slightly on the left, some of it of the light that was supposed to end up on the moon got interrupted by something on the object itself. So it ended up staying on the left. Uh, 
That can happen with holographic projectors. You know, if you have a flashlight and you shine it on something, but then you put your finger in the way, then the light, some of the light will end up on your finger rather than on the wall. And then what you get is a shadow on the wall of your finger. I think that's what happened here. That is really interesting. Mm. You know, all the years that I was in the post-production industry, you know, I was marketing and sales. That's what we did. We did high-end uh, CGI work back in the days when our budgets were a million dollars for one freaking machine. But wow. uh, <laughs> um, so that's why I'm looking at this there. The, the, the problem is if I was to cut this out in Photoshop and remove that element, it doesn't. And what we have in the, uh, the graphics business is that this it's, it's out of place. That's all I can say. It is out of place. Yes. It's because weird. weird. It's two object. It's well, it's the, the moon simulation overlapping over the real object, trying to hide it. <laughs> now here I show the moon simulation um, it's a holographic projection of the moon and the plane flies in front of the projector and it causes glitches right across a line uh, close to the bottom of the moon. And the projector is again, on, it's on the left hand side, slightly in front of the moon and the plane, as the plane flies, it flies, if the projector is here, the plane flies in front of the projector. And when it does, it causes glitches right across the line along the moon and some of the light from the projector hang seems to hang off the plane look at that because the plane interrupted the beam look at that huh. it's amazing i want to zoom in on that that is interesting we're mm -hmm. right over on the left isn't yeah it? you can see those glitches there on that side and the two little glitches there in the video you can actually see them moving because I, I took these from a movie from a video a youtube video and you can see the light hanging seemingly hanging off the plane and that Is that that's how holographic projections work because they're three-dimensional and so the light is supposed to form a three-dimensional field. So it seems to, because it got interrupted by the plane itself, it seems to almost hang off the plane. It's pretty weird on the, um, mm. the jaggedness of it. So yeah. I want to get down to this one here. Yeah, that is so... You see, the plane is flying further away now. So uh, the glitches are still there, but they decreased in size. Look at that one. That's the yeah. one I wanted to look at right there. Mm. Yeah, there That's it not is. Normal. Mm -hmm. I can go even further. Look at that. Yes. Isn't that amazing? So the, the images, uh, these things show us conclusively that the moon in our skies is a holographic projection. At least it is now. It never used to be when I was a child. And um, it was totally different then. It could have been now and then because they had uh, sun ha uh, moon halos. So they had moon um, holographic projectors, uh, not holographic projectors, simulators, moon simulators that produced halos. So these were, I call them the halo simulators, the ones that the aliens produced a very long time hundreds maybe thousands of years ago to use in the in the earth's atmosphere whenever the sun suddenly went dark you uh, what i'm looking for claudia and i'm i'm catching it um so this is what you would expect yes normal but here is mm -hmm. where it gets a little yeah. interesting the pixelization shows you that, Hmm. Wow. Good catch. Um, Thank you. That is interesting. There is, there's an obfuscation here. Yeah, it, and it occurs on the other side as well. It's, it's a whole line of glitching that occurs. Yeah, look at here it is right there. Yeah, there it is.
Look at that. So it goes right as you were saying. It's it's a complete glitch in the mm. overall. Um, here we go. Let me get into that. I wanted to pull that one up. Here we go. So here it is. Yeah. Look at that. All the way over to the other side. That is, there it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, you can't get, and even in pixelization, when you pixel out a, uh, a picture or an image, your pixelizations are merely going to reflect the light in the background. This is clearly, a, the, the only thing I can say, that's an obfuscation and, and something be up there. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're messing with us, Claudia. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. yes. So, you know, I, wow. I just show. Um, you can see it. It's just... Yeah, you can see that the moon is a holographic projection. So what they did was definitely they did a holographic projection of the moon crescent onto the object that was in the sky. Oh, and then I what I did, I forgot about. I estimated the size of that moon based on the size of the plane. It turned out I estimated it to be about 250 feet in diameter. And that means that that object in the sky was about 250 feet in diameter as well, because, you know, they were of similar size, the moon and um, the object. So that means that we have, it was probably a very small moon core. Uh, in the atmosphere, covered in its own cloud envelope. And I've written many articles explaining what the cloud is. It's water from these planets. When it lost energy, it could, it, it could, it remained as a liquid, but only a small droplet. It mm. broke up into small droplets of water and it formed clouds. That's where clouds come from. Clouds of water do not occur naturally on our planet. Water is denser than air. Water belonging to our planet, does, it does not remain suspended in the atmosphere, not even as a small droplet. It's still liquid water. It's denser than air. It would, if we try to suspend water in our atmosphere, it will fall because it's denser than air. It's only the planet exists. I mean, I did months ago, I was wondering, why are clouds suspended in the atmosphere? It's liquid water. Why is that? So that's one of the questions I had that now has been answered. They not, it's not earth water. Clouds do not belong on our planet. They come from the planet system. And this has been hidden from us for thousands of years. This is why all we've been taught in the, in the physical sciences, in history, in a lot of the sciences, is all wrong. It's to hide these things. We are meant to be confused all the time, to believe things that are illogical. So we cannot think clearly and realize what's really happening on this planet. I happen to agree. I think that the, you know, it's hard to get reality in its uh, spatial proportions. Mm -hmm. Well, another hour's gone by. Oh, wow. That was <laughs> time travel. <great. laughs> this gets condensed. Yeah. So, Claudia, um, I've left your What do you have coming up on your channel? I know you're writing all the time. And, yeah, and um, I'm just writing that little article, which will be the introduction for my book. And, is and that I'll probably make a video out of it as well. I sometimes change it a little bit for the book. And all right. So is the new book forthcoming pretty soon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to put it together. I'm going to use, I've, I've come, I've answered so many questions. I've written so many articles answering these questions that I just have to, I, I might even do more than one book because I have so much. I love this. <laughs> well, people, make sure you go over there and subscribe and yeah. make sure that you hit the notification. YouTube has had a real problem. Mm -hmm. I'm having issues. People are finding that they, uh, I actually found that I was unsubscribed to another of uh, channels and I went, well, I didn't unsubscribe them. So, um, so you have anything coming up this week over in your channel? Um, you, I, I haven't planned ahead, Wayne. I'm just, you know, I just, I know you're always, I have lots of ideas about what to write. Uh, I want to write something on 
the rings of Saturn. I want to explain exactly how vort uh, water vortices form because I figured that out, but it take drawings and diagrams, take some time. I have lots of articles in my mind that I want to write, just haven't had the time yet. It is the one thing that eludes us the most. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Dr. Albers, Claudia, thank you again. Thank you. I enjoy Monday nights, and obviously by the representation of people here, they do too. Uh, I'm so glad. <laughs> I am too. And I just want to thank all of uh, you folks that stop in. Listen, we know you have a lot of places you can go, and it's uh, it's an honor for us to have you here, and yes. we enjoy it. And Claudia, thank you. Um, thank you. If there's a snowstorm coming your way, be prepared. And oh uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. Give my best to yeah. Scott. Thank you. And my best to him. I shall. And everyone, be good to yourselves. We'll see you here next Monday night with the Physicist and Philosopher Hour. Dr. Albers, thank you again, Claudia. Thank Appreciate you, you. All right, everyone, be good to yourselves. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>